Hey, it's Tim here and I have an extra special announcement to start the show today. I want to let you, my loyal podcast listeners, be some of the first people to know that I'm running my very first live piano teaching conference here in Melbourne in January 2020. This two-day event called Piano Pivot Live will be unlike any live piano teaching event or workshop you've experienced before. Not only will you be able to engage with your favorite speakers, bloggers, podcasters, and authors, you'll also get to participate in practical hands-on workshops, masterminds, and roundtable implementation sessions that guarantee you'll not just be inspired, but you'll have a plan of action to take back to your studio to make real change in your teaching and your business. There'll be panel discussions, fireside chats, full exhibit hall, networking events, amazing food and accommodation, and it's all going to be held over two days in our beautiful Melbourne summer. If you've ever thought about visiting Melbourne or Australia, then this is your ultimate opportunity. It will be the perfect start to a new year of teaching, getting to hang out with hundreds of other teachers from around the world, getting inspired, planning your studio, and making real change for the year ahead. We've already pre-sold 30 tickets to our members in just 10 days, and the main launch of early bird tickets will be going on sale very, very soon. There are only going to be about 150 seats available at this conference, so stay tuned to the podcast for further updates as we near our official launch And remember to block out January 23rd and 24th to be here with me in Melbourne. I can't wait to see you. This season of the Creative Piano Teaching Podcast is proudly supported by My Music Staff. Welcome to the Creative Piano Teaching Podcast, the place where teachers from around the world meet to share innovative ideas about music education. Listen and learn as we help you motivate your students, grow your income, expand your studio and become a more creative piano teacher. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to season two of the Creative Piano Teaching Podcast for 2019. Super excited to have you listening again uh, for this season. I hope you enjoyed season one this year. My name is Tim Topham. If you haven't met me, I'm your host for the show. And if this is your first time here, thank you very much for tuning in. You're listening to episode number 161, and I'd love to extend an extra warm welcome to my Inner Circle Piano Teaching community members. On this show, we strive to keep you motivated and inspired and to give you the confidence you need to explore new ideas, teach more creatively and grow the studio of your dreams. And today I've got a very well-known author, professor, speaker and teacher on the show. Yes, that is all in one person. And we're unpacking what intelligent music teaching in the studio looks like and give you some very quick tips that you can try in your own studio today. It's a really practical episode full of useful advice and I can't wait to dive into the interview. Today's show notes and full transcript are now available at timtopham.com slash episode 161. My guest today is the Marlene and Morton Mason Centennial Professor and Head of Music and Human Learning at the University of Texas at Austin. A former studio musician and public school music teacher, he's worked closely with children at risk, both in the public schools and through the juvenile justice system, and his research on human learning and behavior spans multiple disciplines. He's the author of Scribe 4 Behavior Analysis Software, and his most recent books are Intelligent Music Teaching, Essays on the Core Principles of Effective Instruction, The Habits of Musicianship, and Brain Briefs. He's also co-host on the public radio program and podcast, Two Guys on Your Head. I have a feeling some of you may know who it is. Welcome to the show, Bob Duke. Thank you, Tim. It's great to be here. So look, we actually met when you were at the Australian conference here in Adelaide. I think it was two years ago now because we've got our next one coming up middle of this year. And look, I thoroughly enjoyed all your sessions. You did a couple of keynotes and you also did something that I love doing when I present workshops, which is actually teach students live. So yeah. I wondered what, what do you hope uh, teachers get when they see you in action on the stage teaching another student? What are some of the things that you hope they pick up? Well, you know, I, I, I've been thinking over the past couple of years in particular about the idea of how important noticing is, not only as on the part of the teacher, but helping students and learners learn to notice what's going on as well. And, uh, you know, I, I think often when people work with students who are working on whatever skills they're trying to master, uh, the the chunks of material that they work on in any given moment are so large and have so many parts to them, it's very difficult oftentimes for both teacher and student 
to really notice the small things uh, that are taking place. And, you know, I mean, it's, it, it, I, I'm sure this is such a happy phrase anymore, you know, but it's the little things that make things great, you know, and, and I think lots of times, especially, you know, people who are impatient and trying to get through things fast and trying to cover a lot of material in a short period of time, it's easy to overlook the small features of whatever it is you're working on that really lead to something being refined and beautiful. Yeah, I, I agree. That was one thing that I really did pick up was the uh, care and attention with which you gave every little bit of a student's work. And whereas I tend to work much more on bigger picture things with students and gloss over those little details sometimes, which I'm sure many teachers do, <laughs> you, the, the point you made was actually going into depth on one thing and getting it beautiful and perfect and how the student would like it to be set to sound. Yeah. That was the thing that you really focused on, which is what stuck with me actually. Um, and I think you had, you had a mantra of making little things great versus yeah. making a lot of things better. So yeah. tell us about this mantra of yours. <laughs> well, you know, I actually, that, that, that mantra comes from the human brain, actually, you know, right. I mean, if you think about what's required to learn anything about a skill, I mean, the kind of memory that, that we refer to as procedural memories, memories for how to do things. The part of your brain that, that stores those memories and activates those memories is not amenable to verbal instruction. You know, you, you, and, and we know this about all, everything we try to do. You know, we, we, we can't just talk ourselves into playing more evenly or, you know, more quickly or whatever. We have to do ourselves into that, you know. <laughs> yeah. and, 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 I, and I think one of the things that happens is you think, well, what would, what would signal the brain that this is something that it should store or update, right? And the more you're trying to do at one time, the more confusing it is about what about any practice trial is something to be retained. And, and I think the other thing is too, you know, when, when we're reinforced by the accomplishment of a goal, that reinforcement even makes it more likely that we, what, whatever we just did is going to become a lasting part of our memory that's going to be retrievable in the future. And actually, to, to just get better at something, I mean, you're moving in the right direction. I mean, certainly that there's, you know, there's something reinforcing about that if you recognize your own progress. But when you really do it, when all the parts of your body are functioning the way they're supposed to and the sound that you're going for actually comes out the way you intended it to come out, that creates a lasting memory in a way that just, you know, small bits of progress over a wide landscape of goals just doesn't do. Right. So you're actually saying that we can tell our brains and therefore our students' brains what to store and remember and ingrain better if we focus down on sing simple single things. Yeah. And, th and this is not to take away from the value in looking at big picture things as well. You know, I, I mean, what's, what's interesting to my colleagues and, and me, and we, we've been looking at a lot of people who are really experts in their discipline, not just in music, but in other areas as well, at looking at how they practice. And when we talk to and observe really artist level performers, um, they, they do have a big picture goal in mind. I, I mean, they're the, the expressive capacity whether it's playing the piano or playing the guitar or whatever the instrument happens to be, their, their expressive intentions sort of define what the physical goals need to be, right? Because if mm -hmm. I'm going to make this, this line sound beautiful and languid and calm, well, there are certain things that have to happen physically to pull that off, right? Mm -hmm. But to only working on the physical things and not having also in your mind what that expressive goal is, I think often takes away from uh, the ability to prioritize, okay, where should I devote that attention to small things? Because I don't really have an idea of the big picture of what I'm going for. Yeah, that makes sense. And yeah. so what kind of language do you recommend teachers use in order to distill and, and try and get students to really focus on one single thing? So a student plays yeah. a line, what, what do we say at the end? Because we yeah. often get that wrong. I, I put my hand up and say, oh, that was great. <laughs> Every time it's like, that was really not great. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. What language, well, what, what's your suggestion there? Well, well, I, I, I don't think it has to do necessarily with, with, with what we say, but in another way, I think it has to do with what we ask in terms of what we ask our students about what they do. You know, I, I, I find that 
you know, what, what typically happens in school, and this isn't just a music thing, this is a school thing. I'm a teacher, I ask you to do something, you do it, and then I tell you how you, how you did, and we go on to the next thing. You know, that's kind of like the, the, the drill. That, that's not an effective way to learn. And if you think about how, how people, how all of us learn in informal settings, that's what we're not in school, that we're not being taught, we're just kind of learning something, whether it's, you know, how to play a game on our phone or how to find, a, find our way in a new city or something like that. There, there are certain features of that learning that are really important. And, and, and one of them is being cognizant of our own error making. I mean, I think what happens oftentimes when we're teachers, we, we, we hear what's going on and often we hear more about what's going on than our students do. So we're quick to inform them by telling them what's happening and what they need to be paying attention to. But I think what, 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 what advantages a lot of young learners and older learners too, for that matter, is by teachers asking students about what they hear and what they feel, what, what they're doing. Now, all of us have had plenty of students who we say, well, what'd you think about that? Students say, well, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> you know, I, yeah, you know, I mean, so, but, but, but I have a really good solution to that problem. And that is to, to ask students to play things more than one time and ask them to compare and explain how they were different. Because none of us is really capable of doing two things in a row that are absolutely identical. Mm. So when we, when we do, you know, a small phrase or, or, or something, we have somebody play that and we say, could you do that like three times and, and tell me how those three times are different? Well, now what you've done is you switched on a listening mode in the student that often isn't there because they're in a doing mode. You know, I'm, mm. I'm pushing these, I'm looking, you're making sure my foot's on the pedal, doing what I'm doing, but I'm not really listening to what I'm doing. And to make judgments, to getting students to make judgments about what they do, because, of course, that's what we want them to do when they practice, right? But if when they're in the lesson, we're making all the judgments and we're doing all the explaining and we're doing all the feedback about what's going on and not really inviting them into that process, then I think we, we miss a lot of opportunities to change the way students think about what they do. You know, you know there's a really interesting a uh, philosopher who teaches at Tufts named Daniel Dennett. He's written a lot of things about AI and, and different kinds of things. But I, I, I was on a conference program with him last summer, and, and he was able to, he came up with a succinct phrase that expresses something that I've talked about for a long time. And it's the difference between, between competence and comprehension. Uh, and it's really interesting. It, a, a lot of what we do in school we teach people to be competent. We teach students how to do certain things. I'm just talking about physical things. I'm talking about, you know, mathematical equations, that kind of stuff. But it's possible to be competent and not really know what you're doing. I mean, it's possible to get the right answer and not really understand what you're, what you're, what, what you're, what you're doing. And, and to me, that's the great joy of teaching is not just affecting the way somebody behaves, but affecting the way they think about what how they, how they behave, you know, which is a, which is a, a subtly but importantly different thing. Mm, absolutely. Uh, you mentioned the university. Was it Tufts or something? The Tufts. T T U F T S in Boston. Right, Tufts. Okay. And the name of the person, because I know people love researching. Dan Daniel Dennett. D E N N E T T. Fantastic. Yeah. His, his most his 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 most recent book is called From Bacteria to Bach and Back Again. So, <laughs> well, got me captured with the title alone. Yeah, exactly, right? right? I mean, you know. <laughs> yeah, so uh, just going back one step, uh, I think one key takeaway that teachers could try with their students from as a result of listening to this would be that idea of uh, rather than just jumping in and giving a response, one, yes, we could just ask them questions about how they played things. But as we all know, sometimes they're too worried about playing to be listening to anything they're doing. And I yeah. remember asking my student once, I said afterwards, oh, so how did, how, how'd that go? Can you give, your mark, give yourself a mark out of 10? Uh, and he's, he's like, no, I, I don't know. I, and I said, you, were you actually listening to what you're doing? And he said, no, I don't think so. Yeah, right, exactly. <laughs> so, yeah. so your solution here is to actually say, rather than, rather than that, actually upfront say, okay, I would like you to actually play this phrase three times in a row uh, with a pause between each. And I want you to... At the end of that, I'd like you to compare how they went. What are some of the differences between them? Yeah. And, what, and what's really interesting to me about, about that, Tim, is that students who are normally very reticent to say anything about what they're doing are much more forthcoming when asked to compare multiple iterations of the same thing. Mm. You know, it, it, it's, it's like, you know, if you're sitting in a room full of people and you point to some person and say, what do you think about that shirt? 
Well, I, I don't know what I, I don't know what I'm supposed to say. I mean, what color it is or whether it fits, I you know, I don't know. But if you say, look at that shirt and look at that shirt and tell me how they're different, well, now I've got all kinds of things to say, right? Mm, so that yep. that comparative judgment is it. And I want to add one more thing about the asking questions thing. And, and I've been on this kick now for about a, a year and a half. I'm I'm very fond of it. I, I may be too fond of it, but I but I, <laughs> I think it really has some some merit. And that is, you know, when we ask people to comment on what they do. I think a natural tendency, or at least a tendency that's been ingrained in people throughout school, is to express things in terms of an evaluative judgment. So we say, well, tell me what you liked and what you didn't like about what just happened. You know, tell me what was positive and what was negative about what you just heard. I mean, that kind of thing. And I've, I've, you know, in a, in a way that I'm sure many of my students find annoying, try to expunge that way of asking questions from their language. And asking the question said, what did you notice about what just happened? Now, I don't want you to tell me whether it's good or bad. You like that? I, I don't care. I just want to know what you noticed. And what's interesting to me, and I, I, I'm actually doing two two experiments about this now, but I don't have the data yet. But I'll tell you how I want the data to come out. Right? Is, <laughs> yeah. that, when people, is that when people are are asked what they notice without having to make an evaluative judgment at the front end? You know, I'm not just going to tell you whether you liked it or whether you thought it was good. Just what did you notice? that people are actually more forthcoming, right? They, they actually have more to say because that you've taken out the idea that you, you have to evaluate this and rate it before you can say anything, you know? And of course, most of us are loath to say, especially about somebody else's performance, oh, that was really terrible, you know, on a scale of one to 10, that was a two. So, but when you start saying, well, you know, I noticed that 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 the retard at the end, it, it's maybe it's slowed down more than, than, than I would have slowed down, well, no, okay. Well, I'm just describing what I see in here. I'm not. I'm not making evaluations. I'm just describing what I what I what I see in here. And I find that many young teachers, who because of just their social practice and typical social interactions, aren't used to giving negative feedback to their friends unless they're angry. You know <laughs> that that being able to just describe what you see in here, many people are more comfortable talking about what needs to be called attention to just because they're not making an evaluative judgment. Mm. And uh, so I suppose we could do that uh, for ourselves as well in our own yeah. teaching, even uh, after, after a lesson. Now, what did I notice happened to that lesson? Yeah, particularly when things went particularly well or, or badly, perhaps. Uh, but yeah. I also think, yeah, just, just throwing that question out there, that makes a lot of sense. Another great tip that we could all try straight away. What did you notice cool. about that? first four bars that you, you've been working so hard on. What did you notice about it today? I like it. Yeah. Thank you, Rob. That's great. Um, <laughs> now, uh, just, uh, and I just wanted to reiterate too, you were talking about competence versus comprehension. Mm -hmm. And uh, and I, in my own teaching, one of the things that I really love doing with students is diving into the chords and the harmony of any pretty much any work that they're learning. Yeah. Because to me, yeah. again, they could play all of that, read the music, do what the composer says on the page, but to actually understand that actually this is a 12 bar blues structure or this is just moving between one and four and five and oh, there's a cadence at the end and how that works. That sort of thing can be really pulled apart by looking into things like harmony. Are there Absolutely. any other examples of that kind of more comprehension based activities that you've seen work? Well, I, you know, I think a lot of that has to do, I mean, often, and this is, this is true in universities and conservatories too, you know, People take theory class, that's over there, you know, and, mm -hmm. and then they go take their performance lessons and, you know, they take a music history class and very seldom or less, less than it should, does all that stuff get put together, right? Mm. I, I, you know, when, when, when people are approaching a new piece of music, there's actually, actually value in knowing where this music came from and what other music was in in, in vogue at the time and what people were listening to and what came before this and what was sort of unusual about this piece that a composer hadn't written before or and so so that now becomes part of being a, an intelligent music maker right is that you know things like that and I think the same thing can be said for the structure of the piece too I mean like you say you know what the harmonic structure is you know what a, a, a more rapid harmonic rhythm does to the feeling of a piece that a slower harmonic rhythm wouldn't do. And to be able to think about music in those terms, I, I, I think when, when, when students start to see that those things inform your musical decision-making, you know, why would you take more time there? And not just, well, I feel it, you know, I mean, mm. yeah, okay, fine. But I, but I mean, are there, are there reasons why you should 
do something, you know, you, why, why you should take more time or, or change the, the loudness level that you're playing or something like that. That's related to the structure of the music. And, and, and to me, when you invite students into all of that, it, it, it makes playing a musical instrument all that more interesting. I, I'm not just, you know, this isn't some calisthenic exercise that I'm doing. You know, I'm, I actually have an understanding of music that the average person doesn't have. And that's what leads me to make decisions about what I do musically. Mm. And making connections, as you say, so, so yeah. important for deepening the understanding, but also just making it relevant for students too. Yeah. You know, why am I studying this? you know, history over here and theory over here. Let's yeah, put it all yeah. together. Yeah, I totally agree. Well, and, and I, you know, and I think it's, I mean, to me, it's it's cooler to know what's going on than not. And, and I think all the people who say, you know, I'm kind of bored with this, you know, the, the reason they're bored is because it's not connected to anything. You know, mm. I do this thing, I, you know, I'm writing out these scales and modes and yeah, fine, you know, but there's not, it's not really connected to the things that I listen to the things that I'm trying to do on my own, on my, uh, on my instrument. And that connectedness is what makes it actually engaging and motivating. Mm -hmm. You talk a lot about the brain in your books and presentations as well. And, and you mentioned before retrieval, I think was one of the words you used. Yeah. I've heard that used before in uh, practice in regard to uh, breaking up your practice into smaller segments, having breaks from it and coming back and having to pull that knowledge back out of your brain makes things stronger. Um, yeah. I don't know if I've summarized that very well, but can you tell us more about uh, yeah. that importance for us as teachers when we're working on improving students' practice? Yeah. Well, you know, I, 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 have, I have a good short example that kind of makes this. It has to do with like memorizing music. I mean, everybody, you know, especially pianists, that's sort of an expectation. Sometimes a piano is going to memorize their music, or recital, that kind of thing. And that's the bane of many people's existence because it's, you know, intimidating and people forget and oh my God and all that kind of stuff. But here's the thing. In fact, I was just talking to my undergraduate class about this a couple of weeks ago. So I had them do this thing and I asked them to write down the sequence of this that we were playing soprano recorders in my class and I had introduced them to some things that we were playing together and I asked them to write down the sequence of what we had just done. And that was on a Friday. When I came back on Monday, I asked them to get out a piece of paper and see if they could remember the sequence and write it down again. And then I asked the question, if I wanted you to remember this next Friday, would it be better to do what we did today and have you try to remember what happened last Friday or to do what we did last Friday again today? And the intuitive answer would be, well, it'd be better just to do it again. But mm -hmm. actually, that's not what we'd be better. What would be better is try to remember it. And that would make the memory the subsequent Friday better. Now, that's a non-intuitive thing because you think, boy, I just keep doing this. And the more I do it, damn it, it's going to get in there. And then I'll be actually, that's not what happens because what you're not practicing is getting it out of your memory. And that's right. what retrieval practice is all about, right? It, it's not about how stuff gets in. I mean, that's not trivial, obviously, but the big deal is how do you practice getting it out? How do you practice remembering and recalling things? Because that's going to determine how memorable things are in the future. So you were asking about breaking up your practice into smaller chunks. I mean, what, one of the things that's interesting about that, if, if, if you practice for an hour in a day, and let's say you're working on one particular thing for that hour, by the end of that hour, if you're practicing well, you're probably doing pretty well with this thing. And most of us misperceive that how we're doing at the end of the hour is now how we do it all the time. Right. Yeah. Not recognizing that it took us an hour to get to that. Right. So if I practice like that, not only am I taking an hour to ramp up to whatever it is my goal is and not recognize that it takes me an hour to get there, I'm now overestimating how well I know this, right? Because at the end of an hour, it's pretty good, right? So mm. if I break that up into three 20-minute things throughout the day, at the end of 20 minutes, you know, I get it wherever I get it. And when I come back then for the next 20 minutes, I forgot some of what happened in the 20 minutes that I practiced before, and I have to retrieve that again, right? And that happens again in the third 20 minutes. So what I'm practicing in all of those times, that little scallop learning thing is going like this, you know, I, I, I learn something, I get pretty good, and then I step away from it, and I forget some of that, and then I come back, and I have to recall it again. That's what's actually making that memory going to persist longer into the future than it will if I just spend, you know, hours at a time just banging on the same thing. Right. Has the research been done on this, uh, Bob? Yeah, yeah. a ton. 
Yeah. Right. Great. Yeah. So it's, it's mean, just proven I mean, strategy. You know, yeah. I mean, I, I, I mean, the, the thing is, you know, we talk a lot about so-called muscle memory, you know, and and I and really. I don't know what people actually mean by that, but I think what they mean by that is somehow our motor system is remembering this in a way that we can't consciously uh, access, you know, mm. but of course it's not it just in happens, our muscles. It? It's all in our brain. Right. I mean, mm. so, so the memory isn't really in our muscles, but, but, our, but our motor system can run out a sequence of things that happens pretty regularly and do it pretty reliably until we don't. And then we realize we can't access it. Right. Because I'm in the middle of this thing. And now I, for whatever reason, I forgot. And I don't have the sweep and the momentum of doing the movement that's allowing my fingers just to go on their own. Now I have to really remember it. Was that an A flat? I, yeah, yeah. And now I'm screwed, right? Yeah. I, 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 I really haven't known for a long time whether it's an A flat. I just been doing this thing, and I know it sounds right, and whatever, you know. And we've all been so, there. So, yeah. So, <laughs> so I think you know to to be to put yourself in situations where you have to work harder to do what you're trying to do and yet accomplish goals. I mean, I mean, that, that's the thing. I think everybody who's trying to, you know, help people learn better said, well, what's the, what, what's a way to make this easier? And, and by definition, making it easier means you weren't learning as well. There's a wonderful phrase. Uh, there's a, there's, there's a psychologist at UCLA named Robert Bjork, B B J O R K and he and his wife Elizabeth have done a, just a tremendous amount of research about learning and he and he has this phrase that he came up with it's a lovely phrase and he calls it desirable difficulty right mm -hmm. you want to create situations that are desirably difficult because surmounting that difficulty will actually make what you do more memorable in the future my Music Staff is the easiest and most efficient way to run your music teaching business this complete business in a box solution has it all I've even written a blog post on how I personally used My Music Staff to transition to automatic monthly payments. All my students now receive a monthly automatic invoice and their credit cards are charged instantly. It couldn't be easier. From a single teacher studio to multi-teacher schools, it has you covered. It will help you effortlessly manage your students, scheduling, billing, and more. It works on any device, so you're always well-informed and in control of your business, even on the go. My Music Staff will allow you to focus more on your clients instead of being consumed by overwhelming and time-consuming administrative tasks. My Music Staff can also be used as a tool to connect your students and parents outside of their weekly lesson. Not only does it allow students to notify you of any upcoming absences and even reschedule missed lessons, it's also a great way to keep your students engaged and learning outside of their time with you. You can leave lesson notes to guide their practice, assign new repertoire, and even upload content like video tutorials, audio, sheet music, and more. This immersive tool is a great addition to any studio looking to improve their business and set themselves apart from the competition. Use My Music Staff to add additional value to your lessons and help you stand out from the crowd. There's no better time to try it for yourself. Just go to mymusicstaff.com and sign up for their free 30-day trial. It's the perfect tool to navigate your studio through the busy back-to-school season. And I think uh, when we was talking about practice as well, one thing that I picked up from watching you in action was the number of times you got students to repeat things, going yep. over things more, doing more of the same. And even if it was right the first time, well, let's do it again. And at the end you said, oh, let's do it again. And let's do it another time. And it was almost, I hadn't quite seen that much repetition happen, particularly in a lesson, perhaps in our own practice. But yeah. I think that was again, part of modeling what you want them to do at home, right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I see lessons as an opportunity to practice my students. <laughs> you know, so I, it, it's as if they're the instrument playing the instrument and I'm practicing them. So I ask myself after I get work with a student to do something and that student did it once. And I, I often ask this of my students, you know, we're watching a video recording of their, of, of a lesson they've taught. They get to a point play and a, and a student does something and I stop the video and I say, okay, so how much are you willing to bet that that student's going to do it again, just like they did it this time, you know, and often it's like, nothing okay so why are you moving on then why, mm. why, why, why are you going on right I, I mean and i so so i always ask the question of myself this goes back to the noticing thing when somebody does something correctly are they noticing what's going on sufficiently that they actually when, when i'm no longer in their presence and they're practicing on their own that they will continue to notice the things that are the central features of whatever it is they're trying to accomplish you know mm. 
and, and, and so, you know, I, I, I will say one other thing. Excuse me for interrupting. That's okay. I, you know, often what what I think gets annoying to people if they're not used to repeating a lot is you know when we say we'll do it one more time and they do it one more time and we say well let's let's do it another time and they do it, we're going to do that. I I I just replace one more time with some number other than one. You know. <laughs> Let's do that six, 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 six more times. And, you know, students were saying, wow, six, that's a lot. I mean, it's going to take 90 seconds for God's sake. You know what I mean? <laughs> but, but I think people are so unused to that. My, my colleague here, Laurie Scott, who's one of the best Suzuki teachers I've, I've ever seen, seen in my life, will have this little kid come out and say, we're going to do this a hundred times today. And the kid gets really big. I said, well, wow, a hundred times. And it takes five minutes, you know, mm. because it's some little thing that you do a hundred times. And, but, and I, I, I think we, you know, we think, we do something twice and we think three times and oh my God, that was a lot. That's nothing. Mm-hmm. And when we look at people who are expert practicers, I mean, people, artist level performers, there's, there's never one more time. I mean, there are always multiple. many more times. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. You, you also uh, used a quote that I wrote down that said, don't accept anything less than the kid is capable of or the student is capable of. Yeah. Uh, and I think m- many times, I think it's very easy as teachers, you know, we've got a very short amount of time generally. Uh, we've got lots of repertoire to cover and we still want to do some improvising and we want to do the oral skills and all that. Yeah. And so we do accept less than we know the student is capable of. So how do we how do we take that time or convince ourselves of the importance of taking the time to get them to repeat things many times and, and to have those discussions with them when we have such little time? Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I, wrote, I wrote an article once. I don't know where this was. I don't remember where it was. It was a long, long, a long time ago. The article was called too, too little time, too much stuff, you know? Mm. And I, I it, it's it, times a zero sum game. So if you're going to do more of something, you have to do less of something else. And, and I think we, not just in music, but it, but in schools in general, make the unfortunate decision to think, well, I can't, I have to do all of this, you know, mm. I have to, then I have to do all this all the time. And actually, we we, we don't, you know, I I give a talk for probably probably the last twenty five years here at Texas. I've been here a very long time. <laughs> I, I I give the I give the opening talk on teaching to the new faculty. I mean, not just the music school, the whole the, the, the new faculty on our campus. That's so te- I, I teachers as well. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So th- these are all faculty who are, you know, I mean, I mean, they're probably we hire, I don't know, 120, 150 faculty, new okay. faculty every, every, every year. And so, you know, the president comes and welcomes them to the university. And then I give a talk about teaching. And, and, and one of the things that, uh, that I say during that talk, because some of these people are, they just came out of a postdoc. This is their first faculty position and other people have been on a faculty before and they're moving to UT and that kind of thing. But to all the younger faculty, you know, I say, look, here, here's the thing. You probably have started working on your syllabus and everything and put the content of it. Look at the content in your syllabus, take two thirds of it and toss it out. You know, y'all think, what are you, you crazy? Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, I mean, I'm I'm teaching first semester chemistry and my department chair is teaching second semester chemistry. So if my student gets a second semester and she doesn't know something, and, and the and my department chair says, Who'd you take first semester with? And it's me. You know, then what? And what I assure them all is, you know, no matter what you're teaching first semester, that's going to happen anyway. So free yourself from that burden <laughs> of thinking that if you cover all this stuff, it's going to be all in your students' heads because it's not. And so well, and, and, and what you can do instead is think about how can I focus on what are the essential features of artistry or chemistry or whatever it is, and do those things so often and in so many different contexts, that becomes what people think this whole deal is about, right? So, I mean, if you think about any kind of pianistic skills, I mean, you certainly want to have facility, but what are you really thinking about? You're talking about evenness of timing, evenness of tone, connectedness of pitches, whether you're playing legato or staccato, there's a sense of connectivity to what you're doing, you know? Okay, you you can do that all the time on, on a lot of different pieces, right? But if you're spending the majority of your time just getting through the notes, just getting to where you can, you know, get to the, from the beginning to the end without stopping, you know, and the metronome's on eight, you know, <laughs> I, because you can't play anywhere close to tempo, you, it, you're, you're never going to get that sense of that. You know, the mm-hmm. student isn't going to think the most important thing is this little connection between those two pitches right there. If you go from the G to the A, does that really sound like, this thing that happens. I think when it, you know, both both of my grandchildren when they start playing piano, 
I, I, I would never teach anybody piano because I'm, I'm a, I'm a, I'll put it this way. I'm an enthusiastic pianist. So, uh, <laughs> but, 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 but what I would do when, when, when it was time when, when they were old enough to put their hand on a keyboard and, and strong enough to push down a key, I, I would just put my right hand on, a, on the piano and put their hand an octave higher than mine. And I would do something with like two or three pitches and ask them to imitate it. But notice when I'm playing two or three pitches, so what I'm asking to imitate is the inflection. I, I, I'm asking them to go, beat up, ba, beat up, ba. And then my little grandchild will go, you know, beat, ba, ba. I said, does that sound like my listen to mine again? Beat up, ba. You know, and after, and we're doing this little tiny thing. And when she got to where she could actually go, beat up, ba, and said, just like me, that was like, wow, look yeah. at that. <laughs> you know, it's spectacular, you know. And, and the thing is, when that becomes the goal, right? When you're really trying to make something that's truly artistic and expressive and beautiful, then you can do little things like that and take joy in those little accomplishments, you know? But if you're blowing through repertoire because somebody told you you have to, you know, and, and you never really master anything, I'm not surprised that students eventually say, look, I'm, I'm done with piano, you know, I'm, I'm going to go play soccer or what, you know, whatever they want to do because it's not this isn't gratifying to me, you know? Mm. I mean, we, we like to do things that we find rewarding and rewarding has to include a sense of personal accomplishment, you know? Mm. I was thinking too, you, we were talking earlier on about comparison, getting a student to play something a few times and compare them. But as yeah. you've mentioned too, another great opportunity is for us to play something and for them to play something and ask them to compare what was different. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. Well. yeah. I know, I know, you know, I, I talk to a number of teachers who say, well, I don't want to, you know, model too much for my student because I want them to have their own, you know, I, I, I play for your students. I mean, you think about how often does a kid get to sit next to a highly skilled pianist and hear a piano played beautifully while they're sitting right there. Mm. I mean, it's spectacular, you know, and I, I you know, my, my thought is always I, I want to play for my students enough that they think about, boy, I want to sound like that. And, and because I'm right here and they're right there, you know, I can convincingly say, I, I can teach you to sound like that. Mm. You know, you have to do some things to get there, but I can teach you to sound just like that. But rather than just sort of saying that, I can actually demonstrate that by modeling myself things that they're fully capable of doing in a relatively short period of time. Mm. You know. I remember having that experience when I was studying for my own performance diploma and watching, was just watching sitting next to my teacher perform these works without just sight reading yeah. <laughs> these things I'm struggling at. And they were just beautiful. And it did, it, uh, it really has such meaning to see that oh, and experience. Yeah. That. Mm. yeah. Yeah. It's just, I, I mean, I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a lovely thing, but you know, I find the same thing. My undergraduate students here are undergraduate students who are going to teach in public schools and teach orchestra and band and those kind of things. I mean, we, we have to push them because it's not common practice in, in the U.S. When you're a band director and orchestra director, you don't play your instrument. You know, you stand up there with a baton and you talk and wave your arms and stuff. And I said, kind of spent all these years learning to play the damn trumpet. Play the trumpet. You know, I, I, I mean, don't don't sit there and talking to people about what a phrase should sound like. Just play it. You know. Mm. Yeah, I think we can we can all uh, shut our mouths more and play more. <laughs> I can't yeah, exactly. Sure. We're, we're all shockers for that, as am I. Yeah, um, yeah. I, think uh, I think it's an inevitable part of you being a human being. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. I remember doing uh, trying a silent lesson once. That was an incredibly uh -huh. challenging experience. I don't know if you've ever tried it or with your. Oh students. yeah, yeah, sure. Oh, sure. Just, just to actually not say a word, unbelievably difficult, uh, but, <laughs> but a really great experience to look back on. Yeah. Actually. Um, just a couple more questions, uh, Bob. Um, sure. I, I wrote down a quote when you were speaking uh, that has always resonated and stuck with me. And you said something like, kids who always look at their teacher when they finish playing are more likely to quit. Yeah. And that, that just hit me in the face. And I thought, Wow. Okay. This this is something that I need to work on with my students. Can you tell us a bit more about where this has come from and, and what suggestions you'd have? Sure. I, you know, I, I have to say, you know, that's that's one experiment that that looked at this. So, I, you know, I wouldn't say I am absolutely certain that this okay. is okay. <laughs> yep. But the, the 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 reason I sort of you know latched on to that finding in that study, what was was this? I. You know, we all often have to ask ourselves why. Why is anybody? Why are any of us doing anything? 
you know. And I think, you know, teaching music and learning music is such, there's such a mentorship relationship, you know, it's like a master apprentice kind of thing. And, and I think, you know, all of us who have had the benefit of having wonderful teachers, we, we do admire them and we do look up to them and want to please them, you know, and, and that kind of thing. But I, but I think it's, it's, it's often the case that that becomes the primary motivator for students is making sure that they're, the adults around them are happy with them. And, I, you know, I, I, I get that. I know how that happens. But I think that what it, what's required to be good at anything, I mean, really good at it, being good at writing, being good at, you know, painting or playing the piano, wherever it is, an individual has to be able to, 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 to reinforce themselves mm. and not just look to other places to tell people how good they are. Because, you know, you know, you think about how long you've been playing the, playing the piano, I think about how long I've been playing music. The reason I love what I do is not because other people tell me I'm good or because I win something. Mm. I mean, people do tell me that and I do win stuff, but that's not why I'm doing it. That's just stuff that happens because I'm good, you know, but that would never be enough to motivate me to do what I need to do to be really good. You know what I mean? Mm, yes. And I, and I think, you know, it, it, it's hard to get some kids motivated to practice. And, and it's easy to say, well, you know, I'll, I'll give you this or I'll put a star on your music and that kind of stuff. That, okay, fine. I mean, that stuff will get some kids to do things. But unless the kid starts to take some personal pleasure in their own accomplishment and they think, listen to what I just did, that, that was spectacular. You know, I mean, to themselves, mm. then, then, then it, there's never going to be enough of an impetus for them to continue putting forth effort to do what they need to do to be really good. Right. So, the, yeah, so there'll, there'll never be enough stars or chocolates or whatever it is or praise yeah, right. to keep them motivated themselves. Right. And this, so this, we're talking motivation strategies here, aren't oh, we? Oh, yeah. Yeah. And I, and, I, and, I, and I think, you know, I, I mean, when you think about somebody, I mean, kids who are, you know, almost literally addicted to a video game mm. and, and, and you think, you know what? No one's giving them anything for that. You know, there, the, there aren't, you know, it may have some gold stars in the game or something, you know, but I mean, there's no other person involved in this. They're just engaged in the game. And, and, and when they, when they reach a new level or they do whatever the game you know, whatever the game's goals are, you reach one of those goals. It's like a big deal because you reach the goal, right? But but there's a, there's a sense because there's not an obvious, you know, human involved controlling all, all, all of this. Do you think I did that? You know, mm. I did that. And now I'm, I'm happy because I did that. And I'm not happy because mom likes it or be, I mean, that's nice that mom likes it, you know, or that my teacher likes it, but 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 I did that. And, and I like it enough to make me want to do it some more. Mm. But if, if, if I never like it enough that makes me want to do it some more and I only like it enough that I have to get some more stuff from somebody else before I'm going to do it some more, I'm never going to persist at this. You know? So the million dollar question then, how do we convert the piano experience or any instrument into the video game experience? Are there, are there any tricks that you've learned about goal setting or anything like that? Sure. And, and it's, and it's, it's, it's very much connected to what we were just talking about, right. Uh, earlier on in the podcast. And, and, and that is setting goals that are small enough and, and challenging enough and doable enough that people will work to accomplish them. You know, I, I've started doing a thing when I did give talks now, I, I don't think I did this when I was in Adelaide a couple, couple years ago. But I, I was just in, uh, I was just giving the keynote at the Florida Music, Music Educators Conference uh, in Tampa last month. I don't know, there are probably, I don't know, 2,000 people in this big old crazy hall, you know? <laughs> and I said, here's what I want you to do. We're, we're all going to clap together once. We're just going to clap once. No, no, you but did, you did do this. It no, was great. Did I do that? Yeah, yeah. No, go go yeah. on and explain it, though. It's great. Yeah, and, and I, you know, and I got all this room full of people. And, and, I, and I stopped them in the middle and said, why, why are you working so hard? This, this, is, this is a stupid thing. Why, why are you? And, 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 and the features of it were the goal was very clear. Each person in that room was convinced that they could do the goal. And they were making discriminations about when they got it and when they didn't. Every learning experience has to do that. And every, every great video game does that. 
Mm. You're really clear about what the goal is. You're really clear about when you make it and when you don't, but you're convinced that you're going to be able to do it, right? So if you say, you know, here's this Sonata movement, good luck. Well, I, I don't know. I have, you know, I don't have a lot of confidence that I'm going to be able to do that. Right. But if, 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 if you as a pianist, you know, you're, you're teaching a jazz lesson and you have this little cool turnaround in a two, five, one progression, and I'm going to teach you to do this. And we're just going to do that. We're just going to do this turnaround here. And, 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 the, and the kid actually learns to do that turnaround. I think that's really cool. Mm. You know, I, I, I got that. And, and you don't, you don't have to give me a pat on the head or tell me, you know, I get a gold star. Thing. I'm just glad that I can do that thing. Mm. And I think that's where the power of uh, rote teaching, which has become more and more popular, particularly with piano. I don't know about other instruments, uh, yeah. particularly in those beginner first few months has become uh, a really important part of a lot of teachers experience with their sure. students because bang, sure. you can just have success. They can sound cool and they're winning very early on. Yeah. Mm. And, and, and I think, you know, I mean, if you think about the way we learn most of the things that we learn uh, to do outside of school, you know, to, to ambulate, to talk, uh, to manipulate objects, all that kind of, kind of stuff, none of that is done with explanations and instructions. It's all done by imitation, observation, and you try to make you try to do what this other person is doing and and as you get better at noticing and your teacher or parent or caregiver helps you become better at noticing how what i'm doing isn't quite like what you're doing yet and maybe if you did this it would look more like what i'm doing that's how people learn to do stuff you know and to say let's learn to play the piano now look at this code up here on the stand <laughs> and we're going to learn, figure out what all those dots mean i mean why yeah. and, and the argument that people make about why you've got to do it that way damn it is false you know i mean that if, if you don't start kids reading right away they're, they're, they're never going to want to learn to read that that is just nonsense there is no evidence that that's the case whatsoever now i'm not saying it's not the case that some teacher who tried to keep teach a kid by rote and the, now the kid didn't want to play music, but that's the teacher's fault. It's not the process's fault. Right. <laughs> it's it's good to hear. Yeah. You know, I say that with love. But. No, no, it's good. It's no, it's really good to hear <laughs> because uh, I, I've I had a, a few people on the podcast before when we've talked about road teaching. My own uh, beginner teaching framework is very creative, and there's no reading for for months. Uh, it's all about just getting involved in music, copy, play, sing, improvise, create. Yeah. That's the important stuff to me, and it sounds like you would tend to agree. Oh yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, uh, I, I heartily agree. I, I, I mean, you know, if you think about what most people imagine when you tell a kid you're going to learn to play the piano, or you're going to learn to play the trumpet, or the drums, or whatever, what, what they're imagining is is actually playing the thing, you know, <laughs> and, and actually doing things that sound to them like the music they already know. And, I, and I, I, I'm not talking about popular music versus class. I'm not talking about that at all. But sound like music, there are phrases, there are gestures, there are expressive intentions that come across because of what you do. And, and when you start with that, right, when you start with what music is for, which is to convey things to other human beings, well, well now, you've, now you've got them, right? I mean, I mean, I, I mean I, and I, listen, I, I get a lot of talks for teachers in the sciences as well as in the arts. And, you know, I walk into a lot of science classrooms. I see a lot of kids are busy, you know, they're active because somebody said active learning is good. Okay, fine. But I don't see anything in the room that looks like science. You know, even though it's a science classroom, they're not doing the things that scientists do that make them love the fact that they're scientists, right? Mm -hmm. They're doing stuff. They're following these procedures that somebody else gave them to get to this answer. And somehow that's supposed to teach them something that maybe it does and maybe it doesn't. But if, if you start to think about why, why do I do this? You know, why do I play the piano? I think, well, this is why I play the piano. So why shouldn't I create as many experiences as I can so my students get to do that? And not assuming they have to suffer for many years. <laughs> <laughs> to get there, yeah. <laughs> and then they can stick it out, baby. Then they'll get to do something you know, beautiful in the end. <laughs> yeah. uh, uh, Bob, it's a great, a great, uh, great note to finish up on. I did want to great. mention uh, you've got a, a fantastic book out there. It's called Intelligent Music Teaching. Uh, in that book, do you cover similar things to what we've been talking about today? I do. Yeah. I, I, I mean, I, you know, that I, I wrote that as a collection of essays 
uh, for a class that I was teaching. And I, 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 I sort of thought about, well, what, what would I like my students to think about when they're organizing their own teaching and what they're, what they're doing when they're planning in, uh, in, in instruction for their own students. And uh, intelligent music teaching has been out, it's hard for me to believe, it's, it's about 18 years old now. It's gone through, I don't know, it's, it's in its 20th printing or something. It's, it's just crazy. I never imagined, you know. It's still a very popular book, which makes me happy. Uh, and, and, I, and I think, you know, many teachers who have gone through pedagogy instruction, you know, if you look about what, what most pedagogy is about, it's really about, they talk about repertoire and sequencing of repertoire. You know, you do these pieces first, and then this is this is going to prepare you for this set of repertoire. And that's, that's kind of the way it goes. And this book isn't about any of that. It, 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 it's really about how human beings interact with one another with the goal of helping one of those human beings to learn to do something new. Mm. That's great. Uh, and I think that's available on Amazon if people are interested. Is it right? is, yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. fantastic. And where can people find out more about you and uh, the lectures and workshops and things that you're involved in? Great. Well, I, I, I have a, a, a center for music learning uh, here at the University of Texas at Austin. And uh, if you just Google Center for Music Learning, you'll, you'll find that. There are a lot of materials there, a lot of it just free things to look at. There's a wonderful uh, section of the site called The Nature of Expertise where there are videos of really superb uh, artist level teachers teaching students. Uh, and uh, one of those artists is uh, Nalita True. So all the Nalita True fans out there can watch Nalita teaching her own students. And it's a different thing, right? Because when you watch a master class, you know, the relationship's a little bit odd because mm. the teacher doesn't know the student and vice versa. But this is like these people working with their own students and you kind of see that uh, they, they, they let me invade their privacy for a couple of weeks. So it's, it's really, uh, it's, it's, yes, it's, Center for Music Learning. Place, thank place you. Yeah. Out. It's, I mean, it's, well, watching other teachers teach, I think is one of the best things to do, which is oh, why yeah. I enjoyed watching you on stage and, uh, why we've got lots of videos in the, in our membership as well about with other teachers teaching. I think it's a great way to learn. So, uh, Bob, thank you so much for your time. I know it's a Sunday afternoon and you've very kindly given it to us. Uh, it's been fantastic to connect with you. Thanks. You bet. It's been a real pleasure, Tim. And, uh, I wish you the best for your podcast and all of your work in teaching and playing thank you very much hopefully we'll see you back in australia sometime i i, I really hope so i always enjoyed my visits to australia <laughs> fantastic all right take care see ya how much fun was that? I really hope you enjoyed hanging out with Bob as much as I did. Uh, when I've seen him live, he always is inspirational and great fun and uh, just has so many great little ideas that you can take away and try out. And as you heard, I've tried a number of his ideas that I've got at previous conferences where I've heard him speak and it really does work. So I encourage you, go back and have a listen. If you didn't take a few notes and grab a few ideas, go and do it again and make sure you try them out and let us know how it all went. Next week on the podcast, we're exploring lead sheets. I'm going to share with you why I feel that chord and lead sheet knowledge is so vital for piano students. And I'm going to share with you one module from a course that's only available to my Inner Circle members. It was created by the one and only Forrest Kinney for the Inner Circle. And I'm going to explore that with you just to get you started on this idea of teaching lead sheets if you've never done it before. And we've also got a fantastic freebie download as we're going to give away the notes from the module all about styling chords. And you're going to get that 100% free next episode. So you're not going to want to miss it. I'm Tim Topham and this is the Creative Piano Teaching Podcast. Thank you so much for listening. Just before you go, if you've enjoyed today's show, I'd love for you to check out my Inner Circle Piano Teaching Community. It's the go-to resource for piano teachers looking to continue their professional development, connect with other teachers and experts around the world, and to access hundreds of world-class training resources, including our academy courses, lesson plans, teaching videos, technology help, and much more. Whether you're just starting out or have been working hard to build your studio for a while, the Inner Circle community will give you the skills, support, and confidence you need to grow the studio of your dreams. Whether that's just about teaching a small number of students one-on-one -on -one in your home, or about hiring a commercial space, employing other teachers, and building an entire music teaching empire. With courses on both the teaching and business side of running your studio, live coaching, and our thriving community forums, you can get quick answers to questions, set yourself challenges, get feedback on your ideas, and feel confident teaching in new and exciting ways. For more info and how to join us inside the circle, head over to timtopham.com community today. I'll see you on the inside. Ladies and gentlemen,
that will conclude this evening's entertainment. Oh, thank you. Thanks for listening to the Creative Piano Teaching Podcast. We'd love to help take your teaching to the next level as a member of our supportive community. Use the coupon Piano Podcast for $100 off an annual membership of Tim's Inner Circle today. To find out more, head to timtopham.com forward slash community.